issue on today. There's basically two issues that I want to address with you, um, and I feel like these are the two issues that are really central uh, to this conversation that we are having. The first issue is the definition, or lack thereof, of moral turpitude, and the second is the impact of court debt on restoration of voting rights. And I'm just going to jump right in. So, our current law says that no person who has been convicted of a felony involving moral turpitude may register, remain registered, or vote upon, except upon completion of the sentence. Um, there is no definition of the term moral turpitude in our, in our statute. Uh, and I'll come back to that in just a second. But big picture, today, over an estimated 6.1 Americans are denied the ability to cast a ballot based on a felony conviction. And in Georgia, we know that in 2016, nearly half a million people were barred from voting um, due to a felony conviction, and approximately 58% of those people were black. 3% of Georgia's total voting population is disqualified because of a felony sentence. And in the last decade, we have removed more people from voter lists due to a felony conviction than any other state in the United States. So I just want to touch on three problems that we see with uh, moral turpitude, which I'm doing air quotes for, because again, we have no definition for it. Um, first problem is that it has possible racist motives. Um, well, let me just back up for a second and tell you a little bit. Moral turpitude was historically a standard that was just used by judges. Um, it was first introduced in the United States at the turn of the 18th century. Uh, sorry, it, it, yes, at the turn of the 18th century. And for men, it meant, th meant things like oath-breaking and disloyalty, but not violence. And for women, it meant something like sexual impurity. Georgia courts have defined it, and I quote, as the idea of inherent baseness or vileness shameful wickedness, depravity, done contrary to justice, honesty, modesty, or good morals. Um, but getting back to these problems. So um, this, this term shows up in the Georgia Constitution for the very first time in 1877, um, which coincides with the, 15th, the passage of the 15th Amendment and the grant of suffrage to black men um, that very same year. And what we saw throughout the South um, in that time is that states' uh, constitutions changed uh, to use this sort of language. And while there is no explicit uh, racist language in Georgia's history around this, um, we see that same kind of phenomena in our neighbors. Um, for example, in Alabama, um, the president of the Alabama Constitutional Convention um, said that the purpose of this was to establish white supremacy within the limits imposed um, after the recent changes to the U.S. Constitution with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Um, another problem with uh, moral turpitude is that it is vague. As I said, there is no definition um, in our code. Um, in 1983, the Georgia Dr Attorney General had sa said that um, all felonies, all felonies, are crimes of moral turpitude because of a lack of definitional clarity and a totally impractical uh, which renders the, this, uh, this term, um, the third problem, is that it is rendered meaningless. Um, so basically all felonies in Georgia are disenfranchising, even though uh, when you look at the way it was written, there was an intention to exempt certain things um, by using the term moral turpitude. And this problem, these three problems have been recognized by other states, including, go back to Alabama, um, just in 2017, Alabama defined the term of moral turpitude to apply to 46 felony offenses that included serious violent offenses and crimes against children. So they narrowed it dramatically. We believe the time is right in Georgia to take similar action. I want to shift to the next piece, the other problem that I wanted to talk to you about today, which is the impact of court debt on people in the system. And, the, and what that means for the restoration of their voting rights. At the Southern Center for Human Rights, we see every single day the kind of burden and weight that exorbitant fines and fees that are imposed upon people as part of a prison sentence um, impacts their lives. We know for sure that it makes it so much harder for people who have heavy fines and fees to reintegrate into society once they're coming out of prison. Uh, someone released from prison can leave with thousands of dollars of in debt 
Um, that can include restitution, it can uh, include unpaid child support, it can include um, additional fines and fees. And what we know at the Southern Center is that people who are involved in the criminal legal system frequently operate with very scarce financial resources, um, which make uh, the ability to get a job so much more important. However, and, and if without that job, they're not gonna be able to pay off the fines and fees. But however, um, having any type of criminal record uh, decreases the likelihood of getting called back for a job by 50%. In Georgia, certain fines related to a felony sentence must be paid in, in full to restore voting rights. Um, in 1984, the Attorney General wrote an opinion that said that only fines that are statutorily authorized in the law must be paid in order to restore voting rights. But that does not include probation-related fines, fees, or surcharges. So um, what this creates is a lot of confusion. Um, and it's a big problem. A big part of uh, the issue is that there's a lack of clarity between people who are convicted of felonies and local poll workers who don't know the difference between whether this is a fine that prevents voting or whether it's a fine that does not. Moving on to my next slide. We believe and studies show that, re that um, restoring the right to vote will have a positive impact on recidivism. We have, over the last decade in Georgia, undertaken massive reforms to our criminal justice system. And a big goal, two big goals of, of those reforms were to reduce recidivism and to reduce unnecessary spending in our prisons. Research shows that when people are released from prison are given uh, meaningful and inclusive opportunities to invest in their communities, they are far more likely to come in further contact with the criminal legal system. And there are demonstrated positive impacts on recidivism when people participate in the democratic process by being allowed to vote. In fact, one study found that voting reduces the likelihood of reoffending by 50%. So just coming back to um, what I was saying in the beginning, we basically have two recommendations for y'all, two things to look at. Number one, um, we would strongly urge the committee uh, to define moral turpitude and to create a list of felonies that would be considered felonies of moral turpitude and narrow the scope, which is currently all felonies. And number two, we believe it would be important to clarify, to clarify the law to ensure that voting rights restoration is not conditioned on a person's ability to pay fines, fees, or other criminal justice debt. Thank you so much. When asking about um, clarifying, because you, you made your recommendation, but so I still have a question though. Would it be better, to, should we define moral turpitude and then say what crimes are not moral turpitude, or is it better to say these crimes are moral turpitude? Because it's kind of a little bit different. Say, well, whatever moral turpitude is, it's not these 20 crimes or whatever it may be. Or is it better to say moral turpitude is these X over here? Um, what we've seen in other states is that they have specifically defined um, the list of felonies. Uh, I, I, at this moment, I, don't, I wouldn't be able to tell you which way would be better for Georgia, but we'd be happy to work with the committee in taking a deeper look at that. Okay. And I want to clarify something you said. You said voting reduced recidivism by 15% or by, 15 by zero. Yeah, so what because, we see. Well, don't those numbers coincide with jobs reduce recidivism, education reduces recidivism? So, how did, how did your group, how did y'all pare it down that, that voting was the direct impact of the 50% reduction in recidivism? My understanding was that it was based on a study that focused on voting, and um, I believe the study is footnoted in okay. the memo, um, but it was looked at individually. Okay, so that was the only aspect researched to impact recidivism was voting. Yes, but you're absolutely right, Mr. Chairman, that we see that exact same phenomenon um, in, in other parts of our society about things that can help reduce recidivism. Uh, just a couple. Before I came to the city, I worked with recidivism in the city of Atlanta. Yes, and it was interesting when we would get, the, uh, get them gainful employment and uh, look at their financial affairs. It was interesting to me that 
while they were in prison, if they owed child support, it was still tabulated. So when they got the check, half the check was missing. I was trying to figure out, well, what happened? And if we weren't fortunate enough to get them a job on the bus line so that they could pay off their debt, they would lose their driver's license. But it was just an eye opener to me how that can affect their ability to reassimilate themselves back into society. You're absolutely right. Um, it is uh, reentry after uh, uh, incarceration is incredibly uh, fraught and tenuous and complicated. And we have been making some big moves here in Georgia to address some of these issues, including some limited record restriction laws and things like that. Um, but we still have so much further go, further to go um, to really look at this piece of how we can uh, support public safety by reducing the likelihood, or supporting people who are coming out to reduce the likelihood of them uh, coming in contact again with the criminal legal system. Mm. And in, this, in the research on who and, and seeing the negative impact of unpaid child support, unpaid fines and fees, or other restitution related to the crime, is any consideration given to the victim that, that the restitution is owed to? Any consideration given to the child who is the responsibility of the individual, incarcerated or not incarcerated, in the research that you did? Absolutely. Um, I would. Uh, I we firmly believe that every parent has a duty to take care of their child, of their children. And that's part of the reason why we do this, because um, what we want to do is create mechanisms that they will be able to pay. So um, improve access to jobs, improve, you know, um, take steps so that they can do right by their children. Absolutely. I, I was riding along with Department of Community Supervision the other night when we were doing uh, checks of sex offenders in Muscogee County. And I think 85 to 90 percent of the sex offenders that we came in contact with all had jobs because they worked for felon-friendly companies within Columbus and Muscogee County. And so I was impressed that a relationship had been built between what I used to know as the Department of uh, Probation and Parole with these companies that were willing to bring uh, men on board that some had been charged with some of the most egregious crimes that could be committed in society, but that the business community was still willing to bring them on and give them a second chance. So I do see that there are opportunities out there to accomplish what, what you and your group want to want to do. So I agree, and we have tremendous respect for uh, Commissioner Nail and his work, and I hope the committee gets to hear from him at some point in this process. Can I ask one other question <clears throat> on the fine issue? So you have a statutory fine. And then let's say the judge gives you a fine, or not a fine, but an order to pay child support, or just you have fines and fees for probation. Right. Would the fines and fees for probation also prevent you from voting, or? or? So we believe that they do not. Uh -huh. um, and this is the communication that we've had with Commissioner Nail. And in fact, um, DCS gives people a certificate um, that says once they're done with their probation, but if they still have fines and fees to pay, but it, it, the certificate says your rights are restored. Mm -hmm. um, but this is very confusing. You know, you imagine a, a typical poll worker and they see this certificate that they've never seen before. Mm. Um, and when, it, 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 it's just not clear for the average person. Um, mm. And people who are convicted of felonies are very afraid, can be very afraid about being in trouble with the law again, so they don't want to take the risk. So right. um, we need to clarify this. And, um, and yeah, and again, I think it would be helpful to hear from Commissioner Neal. And, and because once a person completes their probation, then all they're required to do is go down and register to vote, is that correct? That's right, yeah. but um, there could be confusion even at that point, which is part of the reason why DCS has started issuing these certificates. One of the things we did during the probationary period was I conducted a class on personal finance, mm -hmm. which taught me how to manage a budget, how to manage a checkbook, and once we passed that class, I partnered with Capital City Bank, in which we were able to open those bank accounts, and we would set up allotments to be withdrawn, let's say they were on the court fee or child support. So at the same time, they were not only taking care of their financial obligations and learning how to manage finance, but also developing a good credit history for later on once we move forward to the next step. Okay. And would, would it be your position, okay, that if for the nonviolent felons or whoever, 
that even if they still had fines and fees to pay, that they should not be purged off the voter roll. That's that's really the position, correct? That's right. Even though we're kind of talking about fines and fees, the position really would be that even if they had that, they would not be purged. Yes, that's okay. right. Fines and fees alone. Correct. <clears throat> so they're beyond, they've served their sentence. They've served their sentence. And now, and I guess my thing is fine and fee. They're two different things. Okay, fine comes from the court. It's part of the uh, penalty yes. for the crime in which they were convicted. Yes. The fee is something that's put on by the court to, to absorb some of the administrative costs for adjudicating the case through the system. And those so do you, all and right, do you all separate the fines and fees out or do you see them as, as one bucket? We, that's a great question. I would say we see them as one bucket because there's even more than what you just listed, Mr. Chairman. Their probation um, uh, fees are another uh, another category. Um, and there's any number of other things that can come up. But, um, right, but I apologize. No. You go through a superior court and, and you're, you're, you're adjudicated as guilty. The judge gives you your sentence uh, when you, and they give you, a, let's say, a fine of $1,000. You step over to the side and you want to pay the fine right then and they say okay the fine you owe is uh is eighteen hundred and twenty seven dollars and they say well wait the judge just said it was a thousand dollars and the clerk says yes but there's a ten percent add-on for this there's a there's a five percent add-on for this and I, i'm extremely familiar with the, the add-ons yes. so the thousand dollars fine that they were given right. is related directly to the crime that they were convicted of the fees were added on to the process that they went through. So in, in my thinking, the, the fine itself is, is part of the sentence, but the fees are not part of the sentence. Well, I think this is the part that we need to look at and, and create some clarity around Very the thinking good. of this. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, and uh, our next speaker will be Reform Georgia. Good morning, everyone. My name is Maxwell Rufersberg. I serve as executive director for Reform Georgia. We are a uh, nonprofit that conducts policy research and educates and organizes around criminal justice policy reform at the state and local level um, around the state. My own background, um, I'm from Athens, Georgia, now live in Atlanta, and uh, I've been working in local government for the last several years. Uh, I appreciate you all having this meeting and allowing us to speak, uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Red, Senator Jones, um, and thank you to the Columbus State University for, for hosting us in this important meeting. Um, as you heard, felony disenfranchisement is currently applied to all Georgians um, experiencing a felony conviction who are either incarcerated or still serving a probation or parole sentence or have outstanding fines and fees. Uh, in your binders, you have a uh, nine-page report, I believe, um, from us, as well as this presentation, which is just going to have some graphs. Um, for those in attendance to view, and I believe you have that in your binder as well. The report, what we have sought to do is to provide you with some strong data um, so that you can see the numbers of the scope of this law currently and how many people it affects and why as you consider the need for revision of voting rights for nonviolent felons. Um, so I'm going to talk through some of those, and I will do my best to not get too far into the weeds on numbers, um, and will also seek to clarify anything that causes confusion at the end. Um, I want to start by pointing out that from a high level, uh, when you look at the current felony disenfranchisement population, um, the vast majority, 80%, just under 80%, are individuals who are living in the community. So they are not the individuals currently incarcerated behind bars. They are on probation, on parole, part of the community. And you heard about some of the reasons for why um, inclusion in the community and civic engagement is an important factor in reducing recidivism so that they don't return to being incarcerated. Um, 
So 70% of that population is on probation, felony probation, 8.6 on parole, and you have 20% who are incarcerated. What that number looks like, in 2018, over 266,000 Georgians were unable to vote as a result of felony disenfranchisement. Um, I will note that this number is based on population counts um, for probation, parole, and uh, felony incarceration. So it does not, and I don't know whether it is possible, and how many people are currently unable to vote because of outstanding fees um, that, that may be held against them, whether correctly or incorrectly, based on confusion about the system. Uh, additionally, we can't calculate how many people don't understand the way that voting rights work after the serving of a felony sentence um, and how that may be impacting their awareness of their own voting rights and ability to, to register. Um, so again, of that 266,000, uh, 80%, 211,511, I'll try not to go down into those details, were under correctional supervision, right? 188,000 were on felony probation. So again, the vast majority are just on probation. Um, there are actually 202,000 people as of 2018 on felony probation, but we sought to be very careful with the numbers, and there are individuals who are also currently in parole, on parole or in prison who are con included in this probation population, so we sought to avoid double counting of those. So we don't want to inflate the numbers for you. Now, 32% of the individuals on probation, felony probation, are there for felony drug offenses. 25% uh, of that 200,000 are solely for felony drug possession. 35% um, of the felony probation population are for property offenses. So we highlight the drug offenses and the property offenses because these are typically indicated, included as nonviolent felonies. Um, there are also populations regarding uh, DUI and others, but as you'll see in some of the data on the other pages, if you um, drill down, it's a very small population in comparison. So you're looking at 67, 68% um, of the total felony probation population are nonviolent felonies. Again, uh, 23,000 Georgians were on felony parole. Uh, that's an estimation based on 2016 data. Um, an important uh, thing to understand uh, as we talk about the probation population is that probation sentences in Georgia average for 6.3 years, and that data is taken from the Georgia Council on Justice Reform from a 2016 report. That number, 6.3 years, is near double the U.S. average for probation sentences. So as Georgia has sought to improve our criminal justice system and make reforms, um, we have pursued a path of fewer people entering uh, the correction system, uh, but it has actually resulted in a growth in our probation population, and our probation system. And one of the problems with that is that our propensity for significantly longer probation sentences um, throughout the nation, in comparison to the rest of the nation, means that there's an extended period of time in which these people are losing that right to vote. Um, and we'll, we'll drill down into one example of a felony marijuana possession um, in just a minute. Uh, and I did, so, and about 55,000 Georgians are disenfranchised as a result of currently being incarcerated. Uh, but of note is that 47% of 2018 admissions, so about half, were for nonviolent crimes. Property crimes, felony drug crimes. This first slide, um, this first graph rather, uh, indicates the correctional population from 2008 to 2018. So just giving you the last decade. You can see that it's actually declined um, slightly. It's not very large and you can see the breakdown. But the vast majority of people are in state prisons here. What I want to show this to you for is that while this has changed, we have seen a significant growth in the state's probation population. Um, going back all the way to 1995 when the data starts, uh, there's a huge growth from under 200,000 to well over 400,000 um, and exceeding 500,000 in 2014. You can see that the, again, the parole is a minority of this population. Um, and so the growth is really a result of the probation system. 
And these charts here, what they indicate is the total probation population. So this includes misdemeanors, which of course do not impact voting eligibility, but it's indicative of our larger trend towards reducing incarceration, but a tendency toward, to refer people to a probation sentence. This is the parole population. So you can see that there's been a gradual increase but we're looking at 20 to 25 as opposed to 200 to 400,000, um, which is much more significant. So uh, I'll skip to an example here um, regarding felony uh, marijuana crimes. So. From that same timeline of 1990 and 1995, there's been a huge increase in the number of admissions for marijuana crimes. And that has pretty much all been uh, a growth in the number of um, black Georgians who are being arrested and incarcerated for felony marijuana crimes. While there's actually been a decline in the number of white entries into prison. And what's worth noting is that while the length of stay in prison for this offense in particular has declined from nine or 10 months to four months um, as of 2018, uh, the propensity for following it with a probation sentence has gone from 48% um, in 2005 to a nearly ubiquitous 91% in 2018. So the common approach then that you can see reflected in this one example is that we're reducing the amount of time that we leave people in prison um, but we are more likely to send them away with a probation sentence that follows, which again is extended and much longer than the national average. Sorry. And the, what I would like to just show you is, um, and this is the fifth page of the report. This is not gonna be on the PowerPoint are some potential impacts of proposals as you consider this, right? So you're obviously going to be considering a variety of approaches and it's worth considering how each of these might uh, change the current numbers that we're looking at, that 266,000 people who are currently disenfranchised. If you were to, and again, this is uh, page five of the report that you have before you. If you were to a, a, um, take an approach of complete restoration I, the elimination of the practice of felony disenfranchisement, that's 100% of people, right? 266,000 Jordans with their voting rights restored. If you were to pursue individuals who are living in society to encourage civic engagement, civic participation, um, and again, have them return to the community as we are asking them to do while on probation or parole, you are looking at returning voting rights to 79% of the affected population um, over 211,000 Georgians. Now, if you were to go down farther and consider those on probation for nonviolent offenses, um, and we've excluded parole here because I didn't have good enough data and I didn't want to guess, um, and again, probation is the vast majority of this population. So you, you all are obviously looking at nonviolent felon voting rights. So in light of that, um, that number would be 155,000 Georgians, 57.6 of the currently affected and populate, uh, disenfranchised population. This includes property offenses, drug offenses, and the others, including DUIs um, and some unknown. But again, you can see that's basically 6% in total, where property offenses are a 27% of the total disenfranchised population, and drug offenses represent 24%. I will return, sorry, I will return to the uh, number slide just so people can see that there. So when you ultimately consider, um, you know, which offenses you may be carving out of this definition of moral, moral turpitude um, as you ultimately seek to define it in one way or another, um, I hope that this provides some information as to the impact of the scope that you can have um, on Georgians. Um, again, the vast majority are a result of our descended probation system, which keeps people on probation sentences for far too long. Um, and uh, I forgot to mention 
that our probation population is the largest in the country, right? You, you may already well know that, um, and that includes Texas. Um, and so we are leading the nation in the number of individuals that we keep on probation, and that's not an admirable position to hold in the state. Um, we do have the 10th highest rate of disenfranchisement, and as already noted, 58% uh, of the individuals who are disenfranchised are black Georgians, despite representing about 32% of the population. Um, on the final pages of the report that I provided you are just the data tables that you can see, um, just for your record, since it's going into the record. Those are not going to be interesting to look at, um, but if you want the numbers, I wanted to provide them to you. The vast majority of this data came from the Department of Corrections, the Department of Community Supervision, um, and the uh, Federal Bureau of Justice Statistics. Um, so this is all publicly available data, but it's not always easy to see, uh, so we, we sought to collect it for you. Um, at this time, I will stop and try to take any questions you may have. Persons who are um, incarcerated or awaiting trial, um, are they able to vote? Persons who are awaiting trial? Yes incarcerated. I, I don't have a satisfactory answer to that and I don't want to provide it incorrectly. Someone else may know, Senator Jones, but I don't want to give you the incorrect answer. Do states allow persons who are incarcerated um, after they've been convicted to actually vote or, or are you familiar? Uh, there are states that allow certain individuals to vote while they're incarcerated. I mean, individuals now currently who are incarcerated but not for a felony crime in Georgia are eligible to vote. It is not clear that they are given access to ballots, or it is, that it is an easy process. Um, and there are certain states that have restored all rights to individuals, um, even if they are serving a felony sentence. So if a person was incarcerated for a nonviolent offense, even though we know that it's going to make it more rare, but if they are, would it be a position that they still would maintain their opportunity to vote? Our position is yes, that individuals um, convicted of a nonviolent felony uh, have every reason to be, have their voting rights preserved. Um, it presents sure logistical challenges when someone is within in a correctional facility, um, but there is no justification for the elimination of their voting rights for, for nonviolent felonies um, in, in, our, in our mind. But. Because of the longer There is data that, um, and I don't have that number for you available, but there is data um, on a yearly basis looking at how many individuals, you know, due to a violation of probation or parole, re-enter the system. Um, because obviously a violation of felony probation results in re-incarceration, um, in most cases anyway. Um, we could look at gathering some of that data, um, if, if that would be helpful. Yeah. And we're, we're happy to continue conducting this research or trying to fill in gaps as far as data goes um, to the best of our ability. The reason I ask also because of the uh, apropos of their this on ambiguity, perhaps set up some support mechanisms to help them make that readjustment. Regarding their, their voting eligibility? Right. Yes, sir. And that um, recent change that they made as far as providing a certificate that someone is off paper um, so that they can demonstrate they have a document that states my rights have been restored. That itself has been helpful, I believe, in terms of educating the individual on the fact that they're now eligible to register again. Um, it doesn't happen automatically. They have to go make that, that um, take that action themselves. But I think that that was a very positive step. You, you stated that Georgia leads the nation in probation length. Is that correct? So we may not lead in the length. Um, our average probation sentence length is double the U.S. average. But what we do lead the nation in is total number of people on probation within our probation system. Did you look and see what the average, how we compare in the overall length of sentences for nonviolent and violent felons? As far as incarceration sentences? Correct. Um, I don't have that here in this report. I could look that because up. Because logic would, would lead me to believe that when 
Governor Dale started the criminal justice reform. A big driver behind his reform was to empty prison beds. Absolutely. Therefore, by taking crimes such as burglary and breaking them into subcategories of burglary, he left more inmates in county jails than he did in state prisons because they were able to serve their sentences in their counties. And also, he encouraged the, the judges who were giving out these sentences to send less people to prison. So a lot of these judges, instead of giving a, say, a 10-year sentence on a charge, they were given uh, a 10-year sentence with five to be served inside of a prison and five to be served on probation or parole. So therefore, what he was doing was lessening the time someone was housed in a state facility, but increasing the amount of time that someone in our state would have to be on probation and parole. So I'm curious if us getting into this this uh, high average is just a result of criminal justice reform where he felt it was important to get people back out to the community quicker. Uh, and, and as far as the incarcerated individual voting prior to uh, adjudication of guilt, my experience is people in jail do vote. Um, I know they voted at the jail that, that I was responsible for. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if they were registered, they voted. Right. Um, ballots would have been, it's a logistical nightmare um, because of right. mail and contraband and, and everything else. But, but I, know, I know that did happen. And uh, again, and my concern as the, with the last speaker is fee versus fine. Mm -hmm. A fine is, is retribution is for the crime and then the fee is an administrative add-on and I can see a, a very bright difference between those two. And once somebody's finished with their, with their probation, if they have an outstanding fee, then that should not be a, that should not have an impact mm -hmm. because it, it's, it's not necessarily related to the, to the overall sentence. So, thank you very much. Thank you. And, and I will point out that the voting legislation that passed through the last Senate, uh, House Bill 316, I think it was, does allow for someone inside of a jail not adjudicated as guilty, it does allow them to vote. So. Agenda calls for a break right now, but I think uh, is everybody okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so if everybody's okay, I think we'll hear from, from another group. Um, Georgia Justice Project. Apologize for not having a PowerPoint slide today, but there is plenty of information in your packet. And here would like to see that two documents will come afterwards. Welcome to, I'm happy to share. Um, good morning, I'm Ann Colleton. I'm the Policy and Outreach Director at the Georgia Justice Project, and we appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today about um, an issue regarding helping returning citizens to more fully participate in the life of the Mm -mm. Georgia Justice Project is a 33-year-old nonprofit organization that's representative of low-income people involved in the criminal justice system with a holistic criminal defense model that pairs individuals not only with a lawyer but with a social worker that supports them through pre-trial and their sentence, throughout their any incarceration, supporting them and their family during that time and also after um, their sentence is over in the days and months and years after. Um, and so that... Um, Holistic model has led us to do a lot of work on, on reentry issues. Um, we've had a contract with the PRI um, initiative in the Department of Community Supervision to help individuals address legal reentry issues, and we have currently a contract with the Georgia Department of Corrections at Metro Reentry to help individuals there before they're released resolve any legal issues. 
um, so that when they are released, they are free from those legal um, issues that will help them have a more successful reentry. And we work with jurisdictions all over the state to host expungement summits so that individuals with eligible arrest records can be expunged as a means to um, reduce um, barriers to employment and housing. And we're working uh, this year with the legislature to hopefully pass some legislation that would expand expungement to include convictions, which is allowed in 40 other states. Um, and so following, since we have this long-term model following people with re-entry, um, it gives us um, some familiarity with the struggles of voting because that's one of the things that people are looking forward to doing when they're released. So in, with respect to voting, the problems that we see with our clients, some of it is what I might call disenfranchisement by misinformation. And so every time we give a presentation around the state or in our office or talking with individuals, we make sure that we include voting. So in your packets, you have two pieces of paper that's an FAQ sheet about, am I eligible this, am I eligible that, and that, so it answers those questions. Um, and there's a lot of misinformation, um, not just among people with a criminal record, but within voter registration offices, sometimes even among volunteers who are doing voter registration drives, they misinform people that if you've ever been convicted of a felony, you cannot vote, which of course we know is not true in Georgia, thankfully, um, but sometimes that image, that misinformation is still out there. And it's been brought up also um, the hurdles of proving that you're off paper. You might be off paper and legally eligible to vote but it is often, you go to the voter registration office and you're told, no, we have you down, the system has been convicted of a felony. And so they say, well, no, I'm done, I, you know, and they, but they have to prove it. And so um, we, through our advocacy, the Department of Community Supervision is now issuing certificates. Um, and, but I think it still takes the initiative of the person to ask for it. It's not automatically generated and provided to someone when they're off paper, but they have to ask for it. And if they ask for it, then they can get it, hopefully, and then provide it to um, the voter registration office to help with that. And that um, information sheet is also in your packets. Um, and in the context of this committee's work in terms of trying to define some segment of the population that's serving a felony sentence that um, might be able to vote while they're still under sentence. Um, uh, problems that we've seen with that, um, as Maxwell mentioned, is, the le uh, is, is probation sentences. So in your packets, and I can hold this up, so I don't know if you can see this big red line at the top, that is Georgia. So um, these other numbers are incarceration, but the red line is probation, the number of people on probation in Georgia. And um, Maxwell gave you a lot of numbers, so let me just, I think I'm not sure he mentioned this. The average length of a probation sentence in Georgia is 6.3 years. Georgia and North Carolina, our neighbors, their maximum sentence ever allowed on probation is five years. So our average is longer than their maximum sentence. Um, and I think that, um, DCS and DOC have even changed their vocabulary. Instead of calling people ex-offenders, they're using the word, term returning citizens much more often, but that doesn't necessarily describe the reality for many people because they are not able, even though they're living in the community and working, supporting their families, living next door to us, sending their children to school with our children, they do not have the privilege of being able to vote if they're still in their sentence, even though we call them returning citizens. And so the other thing I would like to show you is the map that I passed out about how other states um, decide who might be able to vote despite um, being um, having a felony conviction. And some states um, decide that based on where you are serving your sentence. If you are incarcerated or if you're under supervision in the community, some states make that distinction. And other states, of course, define it based on a list of charges. So defining moral turpitude um, is not an easy thing. <laughs> different states, different governments define that very differently. And so I just wanted to make one suggestion for um, how we could, might be able to look at that in Georgia. Um, using an existing legal framework, um, 
there's a first offender statute that's been on the books since 1968 in Georgia that decides a certain set of criteria, a certain set of charges are in, are excluded from that um, from that relief using the first offender act, and um, and so, but the other charges, everything else that is not excluded, is sort of defined by the legislature as saying you could look at that and say well, that was a mistake. It's not a reflection on someone's character. They made a mistake. We should allow them to move on from that. So I just throw that out as one idea to consider that that is an existing criteria used in Georgia that separates certain felonies from others. And as an organization that works with people long term, I can say that redemption is possible and change is possible. We see that a lot with individuals. So um, we appreciate you considering this issue um, to um, have another positive steps toward um, helping people within the criminal justice system move on from their past. What are some of the um, contrary arguments that, that have been made about allowing persons to um, vote while they're still on sentence or not be purged off the rolls? That have been presented in other states or that have been, been presented here that you've heard? What are your, your counter arguments to that? Well, the count, I mean, my counter arguments? Well, I would say that it doesn't really, it shoots us all in the foot if we, if we continue to punish people after they have, um, it, it doesn't really benefit us to continue to punish someone after they're back in society. That the more we support individuals to help them reenter and find jobs, support their families, and participate and engage in the community and reconnect um, with larger society, the better off all of us are because then they will be um, better connected, we'll all be safe. And if a person doesn't have the certificate that we're talking about, what is the process that they would go through then? I guess that's the old process. What is that process? Well, I think it's it all depends on the office. You know, there's thousands of offices that you could go to, so it really depends. You know, maybe it's a small town and they know everybody, and so maybe that's not an issue that you don't have to prove it in a larger place. Maybe you do. So I think it, it's really. I think that I'm sure there's a lot of people who get got turned away, and there's some people when they they're just hit or miss. The 1966 uh, first offender statute that you were talking about, 68, and you said the way it's divided out, uh, that it allows first offender status for, for, for some felonies. Mm -hmm. Does it allow first offender status for any felony that relates to any type of violence? Um, it excludes serious violent felonies, crimes against children, and sexual crimes. Well, uh, but there are some assault charges that are felonies that people can get first offender status on. Correct. Right? Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. I was gonna, oh, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> I was just going to ask you to talk about expungement because I, I get a lot of questions about mm -hmm. expungement and Get, and I know working myself was just interesting when <laughs> we would try to uh, expunge some of the, the uh, inmates who were uh, in recidivism status, trying to expunge their records. Um, it was uh, quite interesting, that process. First of all, you know, we have to talk about, they didn't realize in many cases that when we pull their record, it just doesn't only show Georgia, but it shows now other states. And uh, some states, if they expunge, they may it's white clean. But in some states, they may expunge or restore you certain rights, but it's still part of your record. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk to you more about that. Um, in Georgia, currently the only convictions that can come off your record are certain misdemeanor convictions before you turn 21 under the Youthful Offender Act. And once you've been five years off the paper, you can get those convictions expunged, which is just a very small certain misdemeanors when under 21. Other than that, the only things that are eligible in Georgia are non-convictions and arrests that didn't meet the conviction. But 40 states allow expungement of convictions after a period of time. They recognize that it doesn't make sense to block someone out of 
and torn into housing that many years later. We have people in our office applying for senior housing who are denied access to housing because of something that happened 30 years ago. And we don't think that makes sense. Um, so um, we're looking to expand that because I, I know that there are companies that do hire people just coming out of prison, especially if they're working with DCS, which is great. Um, I think though that it helps somebody get a job, but it certainly doesn't help them get a career that their that right. record still follows them and, in, and impedes their ability to really find a career and to move on beyond uh, maybe a low level job that they could get. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a campaign to do that. I'd love to talk to you after it works as well. And, and real quick, what do you find the primary pushback is from companies who do not want to hire somebody? What, what, what's their major concern? Well, actually, we're hearing a lot more from companies that they need workers and that they really want that, and that if, because 40 states allow for criminal convictions, that some HR policies that the national company is based on trends, and so national trends in other states expunge convictions, and so if they see a conviction on a record still in Georgia, they assume there must be something wrong, and so they can't hire them, but they might actually be able to hire that same worker in another state. So. We're actually finding more often that companies want that, and if there is an expungement law, it provides liability protection for companies, and so um, that's something they often want. But if a company sees an individual and they see the criminal history and they see a conviction there, but they still need somebody with that skill set, thinks that person would be a quality employer, mm -hmm. there's nothing preventing them from hiring that employee, right? Correct, other than liability concerns. Exactly, mm -hmm. and, and once the record is expunged, does the liability decrease on that yes. company? Yeah. Just because there's not a record, but the conviction will always be known, right? Right. Well, the conviction is always known to prosecutors right. and always known to law enforcement, but it's not right. known to the employers. Right. Great. Thank you. One, one program we have, the state has, is that you can uh, bond certain individuals. It's mm -hmm. like an insurance policy mm -hmm. or something should happen. And that has opened the door for a lot of people to make that transition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that does help. I mean, they're always still, that stamp, once it's on your record, it, it follows you in a lot of different places, not just that. So, yeah, I'd be happy to talk to you about the second chance of Georgia campaign afterwards as well. Thank you. Thank you. said don't don't stop for him but I think we will take just a, a couple of minutes for him to come up and get a run to his car and uh, be a citizen legislator for a real quick second.